Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be taking a look at the most elusive of all control surfaces, the rudder. Now the interesting thing about the rudder is the fact that of all the different controls that we have on one of these typical small planes in a flight simulator, it's the one that we can never quite get right. Uh, one of the reasons why is because in a real plane, you've got the seat of your pants to kind of know if you're using it properly. Unfortunately for us in the simulator, we've got to go on a couple different instruments and a little bit of intuition. Let's go ahead and get started. So first things first, uh, when we're operating the rudder, uh, we're going to have to keep in mind what kind of controls we have at our disposal here. Now in the real aircraft, the rudder is actually going to be controlled with foot pedals. Uh, some of you may be using twist joysticks. I feel sorry for you. I did the twist joystick thing for many, many, many years. And then I'll throw my, basically a birthday present for myself. I bought myself a nice set of rudders, which, oh man, what a difference that has made as far as it. Especially for those of you who are interested in doing anything with helicopters, you got to get yourself a decent pair of rudder pedals. I won't make any recommendations because, you know, that's an endorsement and that's no good. So the big thing to know about rudder is the only thing it does is controls the awe of the plane. That's it. So if you want to imagine these handy dandy ailerons chilling on the wings here, those guys are responsible for handling roll. Our uh, elevator control here that's going to be a control for pitch that's going to be up and down like this. And our little rudder on the back is just going to be controlling our lateral left and right motion. So for us in an aircraft, um, that's all it does. Now there's a couple different things we might want to be doing with the rudder. Uh, namely, we might want to be using it to get lateral control during takeoff, and we may be using it to go ahead and slip the aircraft from time to time. And uh, some people, especially hardcore instrument types, might even be telling you things like, well, you can use the rudder to make uh, very, very small adjustments. But uh, we'll take a look at that now in just a minute and kind of see what happens. So anyway, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, first things first, uh, whenever you accelerate with an aircraft, especially when you got one of these old school tail draggers, you are at the mercy of the wind because of the weather vane effect. Now, the weather vane effect basically states that wherever the wind is, the aircraft tries to point itself towards it. Now, the interesting thing is we have some things to resist that. Uh, the first thing we do is we have this little wheel in the back, and we also have this little stick over here attached to our vertical stabilizer that we're going to have to stabilize. Now, to make things a little more complicated for us, of course, because this aircraft propeller blade is descending this way, it will twist our aircraft in its opposite direction. Again, equal and opposite reaction kind of a thing. On top of that, because one propeller blade is descending into the air and one plate is lifting up into it, it is going to create something called P factor, which is going to have an even more aggressive tendency to pull us off course, requiring a little bit of fancy footwork on our part in order to keep that maintained. So how do we know that we're doing the rudder correctly? Well, first of all, if you're on the ground, you're doing the rudder correctly if you're not going off into the grass. If you're in the air, you know you're doing the rudder correctly because this instrument right here is going to show that there's perfectly lined up with the triangle above it. So let's go ahead and get airborne and I'll play around with this rudder a little bit. Go ahead and release the parking brake. Go ahead and smoothly apply full throttle here. One of the tips for tail draggers, smooth acceleration. All right, now as we accelerate, our rudder becomes more effective. You can see that a little bit of gusts of wind there. Once we get up a little bit more speed, again, I'm going to be quite a bit of right foot here. And we are now airborne. And you can see right away that the force required to keep me straight on that runway is actually making the aircraft slip. Go ahead and pause for a moment and show you what I mean here. You can see that our aircraft is actually squeezing itself to the right, basically, and skidding sideways. If you want to imagine, our airplane's pointing this way, but our plane's actually traveling this way. You can also see by the back of the rudder set all this, I'm giving this thing a little teeny tiny push trying to keep that thing nice and straight. Remember, I needed that in order to keep the aircraft safe on the ground laterally. So let's go ahead and unpause. And now what we need to think about, that I just speed up my aircraft? Ah... Uh, Ha, I almost thought I sped up my aircraft. Fun. So now that we're airborne, I'm going to go ahead and I'll reduce my RPM a little bit. That makes things a little bit better for us. Get down to about 2,500 RPM. We don't need to be cranking on this thing. This is the same engine, by the way, as a Cessna, which I thought was absolutely wild. All right. So now we are cruising nicely. We're getting bounced around pretty good from that. Okay. So now we need to be considering our climb here. As the aircraft turns, it's going to have that very, very strong tendency to basically twist itself because that you can literally see the propeller in action here, as well as that P factor. So to compensate for that, all you're going to do is push the rudder pedal in the direction that this needle indicates. So in this case, if I let go of my rudder completely, it actually centers up pretty nice. But if this were to slip over to the right, I go ahead and push my foot a little to the right. If it were to skid to the left, I go ahead and push it a little bit to the left in order to keep everything now nice and coordinated and working out fairly well for us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a little bit of altitude underneath us before we take a look at our second point here. Go ahead and I'll go ahead and set my mixture as well while I'm at it. Why not? And then we'll take a look at what else we can do with this uh, fancy pants rudder here. Go we'll get ourselves just a little tiny bit of altitude. All right, 1,500 feet feels pretty good today. Go ahead and drop that one down. I'm going to go ahead and reduce my power a little bit here. I don't need to be ripping along quite fast. Okay, so I'm going to let the aircraft build up just a little bit of speed. Uh, now that they all, we are a little bit more even to the air and angle of attack is reduced, we're not going to require as much rudder. 
Now, some aircraft, because of their tremendous amount of power, may have an issue where you are still going to be out of coordination here. Now, we can deal with that with a rudder trim, or, of course, we can just mash the rudder itself. Let me go ahead and uh, level ourselves up really aggressively here. You know, I want to make sure this thing, aircraft is going real nice before we get too serious here. Go ahead and flip on the automatic pilot. I'm just going to let the altitude hold for a second. Go ahead and stabilize us just a little bit before we get too carried away with what we're going to be doing next. So the altitude hold is basically going to set up my trim for me. And this, I'll basically come over here and set up the rest of my power settings. Let's get this to about 25 inches, about 25. I'm going to go ahead and set my mixture as well. All right, perfect. Now we're good to go. Okay, so what happens when we just go ahead and kick the rudder? Well, let's experiment. I'll go ahead and shut off the automatic pilot. Push the rudder all the way to the right and pause. Now, two things happened. The first thing you probably noticed, initially the nose of the aircraft started to shift this way. Then you notice the aircraft immediately rolled. Um, fun fact, um, I'm not rolling my ailerons in the slightest. As a matter of fact, you can see just how far I've deviated my rudder. It does not take much. The reason for this is because the rudder itself is mounted above the center of gravity of the aircraft. And as such, uh, when you deflect it, not only does it push the nose over, but it also induces a rolling motion because it doesn't evenly hit. So eventually, if you want to imagine you're adding a twisting force and a yawing force at the same time. Now, here's where rudders get interesting. Go ahead and unpause. I'll let go of the rudder. Now, notice the nose snapped back. I'll go ahead and push it and let go. You'll notice it comes right back to center. The reason it has that snap back effect is because of the weather vane. Now, when I'm pushing the thing over, I'm basically forcing it to be over, causing the aircraft to fly itself in a skid. When I release it, the weather vane effect will take over and basically snap the aircraft back straight again, uh, just the way that we had it originally. Now, it doesn't matter what rudder I use here. I could do the same thing over here. It doesn't really turn me. If anything, you can now see it's induced some roll. So I'm going to go ahead and balance this out a little bit, make sure everything's looking good. So now you're going, well, uh, what is the rudder going to be used for during flight then? I mean, obviously, you know, you can use it to skid yourself all over the place. I mean, what would you use it for other than, you know, coordinating? Well, that's when things get interesting. I'm going to go ahead and pause one more time and show you what I mean here. So we have an interesting problem with aircraft, and that's because our aileron design creates a fun little problem called adverse yaw. What adverse yaw is, is basically, if you want to imagine, if I take this aircraft on pause for a second, and I pitch it like this, you'll notice now that if you want to imagine this in a three dimension as far as forces, I have one wing that is traveling a shorter distance than the other wing. So you're saying, so, well, that means that this wing, if you want to imagine things as if it's a circle, is going to be closer to the inner radius, meaning it's going to be traveling at a slower speed and therefore going to be producing less drag than the outside wing. So when you deploy your ailerons for the first time, you actually cause the aircraft to skid in the opposite direction of the turn that you're actually engaging in. Let me go ahead and hop inside the aircraft. We're going to unpause again level myself out. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the aircraft and I'm just going to concentrate on what happens to my level of coordination here. So I'm going to go ahead and jam on the ailerons and pause. You can see, see how it recentered itself as soon as I got rid of the ailerons there. I'll go ahead and unpause, bring myself aggressively to that direction. And you'll notice whenever I turn aggressively that my aircraft skids in the opposite direction of where my ailerons are being worked to because of this aileron effect. Now, making things even more exciting is, yes, you know, they're not moving that much differently, but like I said, that aileron that is away from you is going to be creating more drag than the aileron that is going to be going into the corner. That's just basically how that's going to have to work. So what we need to do with our rudders as well is when we execute turns is we need to apply rudder in the direction of the turns while we're moving our ailerons. So if I go ahead and I turn the aircraft to the left, I have to actually push a little bit of left pedal in order to keep the aircraft level. Now, when I want to start turning in the opposite direction, remember that outside wing is still going to be creating more drag. I need to now apply rudder along with aileron and try to keep that needle as centered as possible. Now, where it gets interesting is once I've gotten the turn at the correct angle that I want, you don't have to apply as much aileron or rudder forces to it. But when I want to come back out, you have to apply rudder at the same time as the aileron that you're going to be using. Now, the more aggressive you are with your ailerons, the more aggressive you're going to have to be with the rudder. So if I jam on both of them together, you get something that kind of goes like this. So learning exactly how much rudder it takes for how much aileron 
requires a lot of practice with an aircraft. And I'm not going to lie, this aircraft, I'm not as used to the rudder forces as I am some of the other aircraft, especially the F-14 at low speed. Now, making things extra complicated here is on account of the fact that with that rudder, you have to remember that as the aircraft travels slower, you're going to require a greater deflection to make the same sort of motion. To prove my point there, I'm going to go ahead and slow this aircraft way, 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 way down. I'm going to hold the nose up just a teeny tiny bit here. Folks in the comments are going to be ripping me apart for adverse yaw there. All you got to know is the wing that's away from your turn is going to be the one that's going to be generating more drag. All right, now I'm going nice and slow here. I'm going to go ahead and bring in a little bit of throttle here, just a teeny, tiny, tiny bit. And we'll hold ourselves at, uh, we'll do a nice classic slow flight right here. And about 60 knots should be enough. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and deflect my ailerons a little bit. And you can see, because we don't have as strong of a weather vane effect, it has a very profound impact on how out of coordination the aircraft is going to be. Likewise, when I go to push the rudder to fix those coordinations, I have to push it significantly further because there's not as much air moving over it as I'm taking my turns. So that's something you're going to have to watch out for. Now, if I give this thing full throttle, go ahead and give it full everything. I'll go out and put this thing into a nice little dive here. Pick up a ton of energy. Oh, it looks like an interesting school straight ahead. Maybe some kind of office building. There we go. Now we're up in the yellow. Now when I take my turns, I can push the rudder, basically just put pressure on the rudder. I don't even have to shift it forward for the same level of effect. So that's one of the big purposes of the rudder. And again, it takes a lot of experience and you'll get the hang of it eventually for knowing exactly how far you have to put that uh, rudder forward in order to equally balance out the forces. And the real plan, I hate to say it, it's easier because you can feel it out very, very smoothly. Let's go ahead and drop my power back to about uh, 25 inches here. And uh, we'll go ahead and take a look at another question somebody was asking. Uh, they were asking specifically, basically, you know, is it okay to have the uh, rudder and opposite, you know, the aileron? Well, in general, no matter what, you have to keep the rudder um, as far as coordination centered. It doesn't matter if you go in a straight line. It doesn't matter if you climb. It doesn't matter if you're turning. The reason for that is if your aircraft enters into a stall, you will stall unevenly. And everybody who uh, knows planes knows if you stall unevenly, basically you're going to be putting yourself into a really, really, really nasty sprint. To prove my point, I'm going to go ahead and reduce my throttle a little bit here. In case I need to do an aggressive recovery, I'm going to go ahead and bring my nose up a little tiny bit. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, just, you know, do the best I can as far as uh, keeping this nice and coordinated. And I'll fly myself right into everybody's uh, favorite stall here. Pull that nose up. It's going to start getting pretty grumpy. And that nose falls nice and boring, basically straight down. I'll smoothly apply full power. Fly myself back out of it. And this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to push the rudder all the way over and pull back at the same time. Now this aircraft is one of the, whoop, there it goes. You can see the aircraft starts sinking to that side. Now this aircraft is extremely stable. You know, many aircraft are not this stable. So as soon as you try to pull something like that, the aircraft is basically going to stall itself right out of the sky and potentially spin. I'll try it on a Cessna sometime. It's uh, pretty nasty. So the final use of the rudder, of course, is for the purposes of intentional slips. Now intentional slips are dangerous because uh, when you tend to do them, it tends to put you at the risk of uh, an un uncoordinated stall as we just saw a few moments ago. But the real use for a slip is to allow us to dive at a very, very sharp angle or to make the nose of the plane travel at a different direction than the actual position of the track of the plane. Now, the reason we need that is when you have a crosswind landing. Uh, we have a video a little while ago where it showed you a classic technique where basically you're going to be using the rudder in order to keep the plane pointed at the end of the runway, and then you're going to use the aileron to control the drift. Uh, that's called the wing low method. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'll go bring myself all the way around here. And we're going to line ourselves up with an incredibly small runway. But what we're going to do is we're going to intentionally use the rudder to make the entire airplane fly what they call a slip. A slip, an intentional slip in this case, is actually going to make our whole airplane basically pretend it's a giant air brake so that it can help slow us down even more aggressively. Keep in mind when you're doing slips, uh, generally you don't want to be doing them with the flaps completely deployed. That's considered uh, kind of bad form, but again, uh, do what works for you. It's, it's your simulator. You can decide kind of what you want to do. We'll go ahead and deploy our flaps all the way down. You can watch that handle getting out of my way. And I'm going to come spinning around real quick. I've done a video on uh, how to do slips before, but basically what I'm going to do is uh, show you how you can do it again. Go ahead and point the plane. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and kick the nose of the plane opposite, and I'm going to tip the left aileron down so that our track towards the end of the runway stays evenly. So now I've got my rudder completely deflected, and this entire aircraft right now is basically acting as if it's a giant air brake, or speed brake, I should be fair. I don't even know if these planes have air brakes anymore. I know there's some Russian planes with air brakes. All right, so now we're just kind of flying sideways here. And again, I am barely at the controllable speed. If we were to stall right now, we would crash badly. 
All right, go ahead, slow me down a little bit here. And again, I'm flying the plane sideways in order to slow me down. If I pull the throttle back, I'm gonna go ahead and transition into a landing here. We're a little bit crabbed, but that's okay. And we're down. So again, by flying that slip intentionally, I was able to keep the plane from accelerating. I'm trying to keep us on the runway here. Whee! <laughs> My mistake, by the way, with these planes is always hitting the brake too hard. All right, hopefully that answers uh, some basic questions about rudders. Uh, the key thing is, it's just for using controlling yaw. You know, there's not really a lot more else to it. It's a lot easier with rudder pedals than it is without. And uh, just remember, the more aggressive you are with the turn, the more work it's going to be to keep everything coordinated. Enjoy.